Tasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaom Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desha Tarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevata Patita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Bhagavad Gita for Bhakti Shastri. In the last class yesterday we studied chapter 15, so today we're going to go on to chapter 16. And we have a little revision of 15 before we begin 16. Oh, wait. I'll have to share this screen. I have this slideshow. Okay, I'll share the screen. Screen share. Is everyone able to see? Hare Krishna, are you seeing the slide? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Okay, so yes, yesterday we talked about the banyan tree, the analogy. Do you all remember the banyan tree? Yes, Maharaj. You remember? What, what do we call the, the branches down in Sanskrit? What's the term? Urdamulam. Urdamulam. That's the root. The roots up. What's the branches? Yes, right. And what do the fruits represent? The fruit of the banyan tree? Dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. Okay, and, and what's nourishing the tree? Modes of nature. The modes of nature, all right. And the tree is situated on? Our desires. Tree is situated on desire. And the the tips of the branches represent leaves. The senses. The senses, right? And the sense objects are twigs. Tips of the branches. Twigs. Okay. Right. Okay, and then the meaning of Purushottam Yoga, the yoga of the Supreme Person, that we have to connect with the Supreme by yoga, by devotional service. So that was explained in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 15th chapter. You can read Trisloki Gita, Sambandha, and, and then the process Abhidaya, engaging in his service. We discussed the relevance of Bhagavad Gita 14.3.4 in relation to current social, moral and environmental issues. Bhagavad Gita 14.3.4, that's, that's the three modes of nature. Yeah, we, that was earlier we did that, two days ago. We talked about the 
different ways in which the verse Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhutta Sanatana, right? How it can be used to uh, bring people together, see everyone as a brother, and understand the material nature belongs to Krishna. We should take care of the material nature, we shouldn't exploit it, we should protect it. Application of 15.7 and 15.15 in preaching, Krishna Consciousness. Right? We spoke about these 15.15, we spoke about Krishna's in everyone's heart. So, he's inspiring everyone in different ways, according to their desire. For some people he will give knowledge, for some he will allow them to forget, so they can enjoy the material life, try to enjoy the material life, their attempt, the attempt to enjoy. And for others he allows them to remember, so that they can be more serious and dedicated in the practice of Krishna Consciousness. And Krishna also comes in the form of the Vedas. Srila Vyasadeva wrote the Vedas, gave the Vedic knowledge, gave us the Bhagavad Gita. So from the Vedas we can also know Krishna. Okay, here are some questions. What is the tree of the material world situated on? Desire. Yes. Give the English meaning Urva Mulam and Adasakam. Urva Mulam is the root. Roots. What? Adasakam. Adasakam are the branches going down. Branches. Going downwards. And where where are the roots? Roots are going upwards. And the roots are up, right. What do the leaves on the banyan tree represent? The Vedas. 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 The Vedic hymns. The Vedic hymns. Vedic hymns, right? And the tips of the branches, the senses, the twigs, the sense objects. This banyan tree is nourished by? The three three modes of, of, of nature, nature. nature. And what's the English meaning of Asanga Shastrena? Weapon of detachment. Weapon of detachment. Okay, so what, how, what is that weapon? Detachment, right? Detachment. Detachment from? Material world. Okay. Material okay. From our false presence. All right. So you got all that right? So we're going on divine and demoniac nature. First of all, connection between the chapters, right? Chapter 14 was describing what? What was chapter 14? Modes. The three modes, three right? Three modes. Right, and, and in chapter 14 we were told, we were told to try to cultivate the mode of goodness and to give up the modes of passion and ignorance. To come up to the mode of goodness will be very good for us for our spiritual advancement, if we can cultivate more the mode of goodness. Did you get the article? Did you read it about how to cultivate the mode of goodness? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, did you? So, Barijan Prabhu said to Prabhupada, I thought devotee is transcendental. And Prabhupada said, yes, but generally they're in the mode of goodness. To become transcendental, we have to cultivate the mode of goodness. And that means to get free of passion and ignorance. So this connects us to chapter 15. In chapter 15, we have the banyan tree, right? And who's in the upper branches? Who lives in the upper branches of the banyan tree? It's Brahmlo, Brahmlo and higher planets. What living entities live up there in the upper branches? The demigods. demigods. The demigods, right. The demigods are living in the upper branches. The demigods, the residents of heaven, like that. And even the Kandarva Loka and the, the Vijadharas, these people from the higher planets, they live in the upper branches. 
And who is in the lower branches? People of the lower planets. Who? Lower, pl lower planets and the lower planetary systems like Narga. Asuric. Below Asuric. Well, we are in the lower branches. The human beings. The human Listen. Hey, listen. The human be the human beings are in the lower branches. The earthly planet. We're there. And all the animals. The dogs, the cats, all these different animals, creatures, they're all in the lower branches and we're also there. So, because we're influenced by passion and ignorance, so we're there in the lower branches. Look at the relationship, right? So the demigods, they're more in the mode of goodness, so they're in the upper branches. We're not much in the mode of goodness, we're more passion and ignorance. And now we're going to go on to chapter 16 and we're going to talk about the divine and the demoniac nature. So the divine nature means those who have cultivated the mode of goodness. Without cultivating the mode of goodness you won't develop these divine qualities. And the people who are in the mode of passion and ignorance, they have all these demonic qualities. Lazy, arguing, quarreling with each other. These kind of tendencies are all there in the demonic mentality. Alright, so this, this is the connection between these chapters explaining. We're going to go on. So chapter six, 16 will describe first of all Sampadam Daivim, the divine qualities. There are actually 26 divine qualities. But these qualities are not meant for everyone. It depends on which ash ashram, which occupation and which varna you're in. Different people and different statuses of life will have different qualities. We will explain it in a minute. Right? So Devi Sampad, the divine qualities, and then 16.4 will explain Sampadam Asurim, the demoniac qualities. We should note there are only the two, there are only the two natures. There's the divine and there's the demoniac. There's nothing in between. Sometimes people don't like, they feel a little worried, well I may not be divine but I'm not a demon either, I don't want to be a demon, uh, even I'm not divine, there must be something in between. But Krishna says no, there's nothing in between. There's only the two natures, there's the divine nature or there's the demoniac nature. What nature are we going to cultivate? I hope we're going to cultivate the divine qualities. Right? We're going to speak first of all about the divine qualities. Alright? Now if you have your student uh, handbook, the, the teaching material, there's a chart with the 26 qualities given on page uh, 76 and 77. 76 and 77 has all the qualities listed and it also lists the uh, varna or ashram which is, which is being connected to that particular quality because it will vary, it's not the same. And it also gives us, there's also comments for the different qualities. Alright, so we're going to go through them. Begin with, first of all with fearlessness. Now fearlessness is a quality generally for the sannyas. The sannyasis, they should be fearless in the sense that they will go everywhere and depend on Krishna. They don't worry about, oh where will I get my prasadam, oh where will I stay, 
No, they don't care. They just go and they depend on Krishna. This is the quality which is required for somebody in the renounced order of life. And Srila Prabhupada showed that quality, right? Srila Prabhupada would go on the boat to America and how much money did he take? Yeah. Did he have any any dollars at all? No. No. Well, when he was on the boat, when he was on the boat, he sold a set of he sold his Bhagavatams, three volumes, to the captain of the ship, and the captain of the ship gave him twenty dollars. Right. So he had twenty dollars. Prabhupada said that is spending money for just an hour or two in America. Even in Prabhupada's time, wasn't very much money. Now, wouldn't even pay a taxi fare. But Prabhupada was going depending on Krishna. This is the quality one should have. One shouldn't just think, oh, uh, there's no temple there, I can't go there. Oh, and that, that place, they don't have anywhere for me to stay, I won't go there. No, you, you can't think about these things. And we see the example of the Goswamis also, how they lived in Vrindavan. How they were living under a different tree every night. So fearlessness, the first quality. And then second quality, purification of one's existence and it's described this is a quality for everyone we should all want to purify our existence and we can do it by strictly following the rules and regulations the more strict we are in following the rules and regulations the more purification we can get so it's it's all in our hands. So we all want to purify our existence. Do good sadhana, we get purified. Third quality, cultivation of knowledge. This is, again, this is particularly relevant for sannyasi because they have to go and preach and they have to distribute knowledge. So they have to cultivate knowledge in order to be able to give knowledge to others. And similarly also brahmacharis may also, they also should study and cultivate knowledge. So the devotees should be very uh, serious about this. Reading Prabhupada's books and doing courses just like Nowadays, you know, we have so many regulations about what you can have to do. If you want to get second initiation, you should have done Bhakti Shastri. If you want to get sannyasa initiation, you should do Bhakti Vaibhav. You should study. You want to get initiation, you have to do the ISKCON Disciple Course. The, the idea is to get people interested in cultivating knowledge. Then the fourth quality is charity. And this is, this is a quality which is really meant for the, the householders. At least traditionally, it was the, the grihastas who were expected to give charity. Cha giving charity doesn't just mean giving money, however. Giving charity can also, can, it can mean simply giving, inviting people to come and eat. Prabhupada would often explain that to people who were householders. When they asked Prabhupada about their duty in married life, then Prabhupada would say, you should bring people to your home, invite them to come and eat. That is charity. It's also charity to give the holy name. When you go for Sankirtan, take part in the chanting of the Holy, that is giving the highest charity, giving the holy name to people. 
That is the highest charity. So it's not just giving 50% of our income or whatever, but some kind of charity can, should be there. Either you give food to people or you give the holy name, somehow or other. You try to contribute to them for their welfare. Next one, self-control. Self-control is meant for everyone. Every, we all have to control our senses, particularly grihastas. People in grihasta ashram, they have to be very careful to control their senses. Prabhupada used to say about married life, he said it's like going to a feast and fasting. Go to a feast and fast? Oh, that, you know, why would you go to a feast and fast? Well, married life is like that. Because with married life, there's always the opportunity for sense gratification. You can cook a big feast, you can eat it all yourself, you can eat a lot at night, and you can uh, wake up late in the morning and nobody's going to be there to get on your case because you're living in your house, in your griha. And so, you have to be very careful in grihasta life to control the senses. It's important. We shouldn't think that we can just do what we want because I'm a householder. Everyone has to control the mind and senses. Number six, sacrifice. Now, householders, of course, they like to do sacrifices. It, you know, they make a program, a, sec, a yagya in their home and invite people. Maybe they have a anaprashna or a griha pravesh or a birthday or something. They want to do some yagya for someone, someone's benefit. But the real yagya in the Kali Yuga is Sankirtan, the chanting of the holy name. Uh, Harinam yagya, that's the real sacrifice. So that's also especially meant for householders, although other people may also do yagya. Number seven, Vedic study. Vedic study, that's meant really for the brahmacharis. The young men, the young single men, they have the opportunity to study the scriptures. And the idea is that if they study in the beginning of life, then that knowledge will be of good, good use to them throughout their life. Prahlad Maharaj says, Komar Acharet Pragno Dharmam Bhagavata Miha. That from the beginning of life, from the age of five, one should begin to study the Bhagavad Dharma or the teachings of the Vedas. So Vedic study is very important for the young men, if they get good education and Vedic knowledge, their memories will become very strong and they'll de develop a, some determination and it will be a great help for them later on in life. Not that they all have to remain brahmacharis, of course, but the good brahmacharis will make good householders. Right. If they're not good in brahmachari life, they, they, they're going to have difficulty also in family life. Next one, austerity, or we would say tapasya, right? So austerity is for everyone. Austerity is one of the pillars of dharma. Satyam sojam daya tapa. So tapa, austerity, is mentioned here as one of the 26 qualities. And this is for everyone, and, and especially for vanaprastas. Vanaprastas mean those who are retired from the material responsibilities. According to the scriptures, from the age of 50 one should retire. It is said, pancha sorvam vanam brajit, that after the age of 50 should go to the forest. So in the Kali Yuga, it's not really possible to go to the forest, but Prabhupada said, we should go to the temple, go to the holy dham, 
go to Mayapur, go to Vrindavan and stay there and do service. If you cannot go to India, then go to the temple nearest you, where there's an ISKCON temple. Go there and do service. That is austerity, using your time, giving your time for the service of Krishna. Later, in the next chapter in Bhagavad Gita, we'll hear about austerity of the body and the mind. It's described in the Bhagavad Gita. Austerity of words is speaking the truth and, and being and pleasing, speaking in a pleasing manner to people and also reciting the scriptures. It's also an austerity. Worshipping the spiritual teachers is also an austerity of the body and austerity of the, uh, the mind is being satisfied in different situations, this kind of thing. So Bhagavad Gita describes to us how we can practice austerity, body, mind and words. And it's for everyone to practice. Now number nine, simplicity. This is a quality for all the ashrams. Everyone should cultivate this simplicity, meaning not diplomacy, not cheating. We should be straightforward in our dealings. That's important. Uh, simplicity. Number 10, non-violence. Right? Non-violence, ahimsa. So this is for everyone also. Non-violence, Srila Prabhupada explains, it means not to stop the advancement of anybody, not to interfere with their spiritual progress. If we, if we disturb the spiritual advancement of someone, then that is violence. So non-violence, it's not just only not killing or not harming any living entity, it's, you know, we should recognize what is actually their need and encourage them, particularly in their spiritual path. Then, number 11, truthfulness. Well, that's another principle of religion, satyam. Socham daya tapa, satyam, truthfulness. And truthfulness is destroyed in Kali Yuga. There's only a little bit of the lag left. Of all the four pillars of religion, truthfulness is remaining only a fraction. The others have all gone. But truthfulness, there's a little bit left. So truthfulness means taking the knowledge from the scriptures. The absolute truth is there in the scriptures. So what we want to speak the truth. We don't have to lie to people. Devotees don't want to get in the habit of being liars and cheaters. Be truthful. Be, but at the same time, when we speak the truth, we should try to make it pleasing. If we speak the truth just to be nasty and just to insult someone, it's not good. Right? Number 12, freedom from anger. Even if somebody is agitating us and disturbing us, giving us a lot of trouble, we shouldn't get angry. We have to control the mind and senses. So anger is, anger is the younger brother of lust. And lust, anger and greed are three gates to hell. We will hear in this chapter, chapter 16, three gates to hell, every sane person should avoid them. So anger is very degrading. We want to be very careful not to become angry, but to control the anger. How to do that? Well, sometimes you just have to go outside. Sometimes you just have to pick up your bead bag and stop talking and just chant. 
But don't get into big arguments with people. It's very, it creates a very bad atmosphere. And it's not meant for a temple. Or living in an ashram or a temple, there should be no arguing. People should be respectful to each other. Then, next one, renunciation. This is also a quality described to be good for everyone. Renunciation, vairagya. Rupa Goswami describes renunciation, utilizing everything in the service of Krishna. Nirbandha, Krishna Sambande, yuktam vairagya uchate. Yukta vairagya, right? We utilize everything in the service of Krishna. That is actual renunciation. Next quality, 14, tranquility. Tranquility means, again, to be peaceful, to control our mind, not to get all emotional and worked up, keep calm, keep in control of the mind and senses. Quality 15, aversion to fault finding. This is one of the anarthas which can destroy our creeper of devotion. If we criticize people, we should learn to see our own faults and to criticize ourselves and to see the good in others and not criticize others. I know it's difficult, but this is what we have to do. We have to avoid these things. Fault finding is certainly not good for any of us. If all the time we see the wrong, will be critical of everybody. We, we can criticize our own self, but it's not the business of every devotee to criticize others. All right, and then next quality, compassion. Devotees, every day when we offer obeisances to the devotees, we, all, we recite the Vaishnava Pranam Mantra, that we're full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. We should show that compassion. We should have genuine feelings for others. We should have genuine feelings when we see other people suffering and in difficulty. We should want to try to help them, do something for them. At least let them hear the holy name. And then, freedom from covetousness means don't be greedy. We want more. We always try to get more, to get more position or more fame or whatever, more profit. Don't be greedy. Be satisfied with what comes by honest endeavor. Number 18 is gentleness. Gentleness means to be friendly with others. Make friends with others. It's a very important principle in trying to preach that you want to make friendship with people. If we're very harsh, then it's not good. In the Bhagavad Gita, it describes Vidya Vinaya Sampani Brahmani Gavihastini. Maybe you, some of you know this verse from the fifth chapter. Vidya Vinaya Sampani, the learned and gentle Brahman. So a Brahmana should be like that. He should be learned, he should also be gentle. Not that he has to be harsh, and powerful and pushy and challenging. No, you should be gentle and kind. But at the same time, next quality, steady determination. Determination, Rupa Goswami in the Upadesha Amrita mentioned about enthusiasm, patience and determination. We have to be very de fixed and determined. We don't give up. I'm not going to give up, right? We're determined that I'm going to do this. I'm going to finish this Bhakti Shastri course. I'm going to complete all the essays. I'm going to learn all the slokas. I'm going to write all the exams. I'm determined. It's very good. We should have that kind. We need that kind of determination to be successful in our devotional service. And then the next quality, vigor. 
Vigor is like enthusiasm, you know, you, you have a lot of energy, you're ready to go out there to do something for Krishna, to take on some service on behalf of Krishna. So you need, we need to have some vigor. But at, at the same time, modesty is also important. We, we don't want, we don't think of ourselves as being very wonderful or very important. We're humble, we should be without pride, we should be modest, right? Whatever we can do, it's by the grace of Krishna. We give the credit to Krishna, if anything goes good, give the credit to Krishna, and if it goes all wrong and I'm a big failure, then it's my fault. Take the blame. It's modesty. Then, number 22, forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is a very difficult quality to cultivate, to be forgiving on others. We know somebody does some wrong to you, you want to get revenge on them. They cheated me or they said this about me, I'm going to get back at them. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a saying we have, we say, an, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So if we have that motive, if we think like that in Krishna consciousness, that's not good. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth means that everyone will be blind and nobody will have any teeth because we'll, <laughs> we'll be trying to, we'll have to get revenge on everyone. So it's very important to try to cultivate this quality of forgiveness, not holding grudges or being bitter against others, but forgive them. Okay, something went wrong. Just like one time Prabhupada was giving a lecture and uh, in the middle of the lecture one man stood up and began to shout a lot of abuse at Prabhupada, really condemning and criticizing him and then he stormed out of the room. He just left. So Prabhupada just said, he looked at the, 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 the audience and said, I must have offended him in my last life. <laughs> right? So we should think like that. If somebody does something wrong to us, we, we don't have to forgive them. We should think, I must have done something bad to him in the pre previous life. Now he's coming to get revenge on me. And this way we can be forgiving, develop that, developing that forgiveness attitude. Very important. Next quality, 23, fortitude. Fortitude, this is for everyone, especially sannyasis, especially, rather, kshatriyas. Just like forgiveness is for all, but especially kshatriyas, so fortitude is also for everyone, especially kshatriyas. And we have to be careful, we have to have this mental and emotional strength when we face difficult situations. Right? We, when we have a, a big challenge, something really difficult, maybe things are not going well, we have to keep calm and we have to control the mind. We can't get too thrown off, don't get too much overwhelmed by the situation. You have to keep calm. Then 20, 24, cleanliness, a brahminical quality, cleanliness. If something is dirty, someone who has a brahminical nature will clean it. They will not allow it to remain dirty. Prabhupada was scrupulously clean. He was very particular to have everything just spotless. He didn't want any dirt anywhere. And when he would come to a temple, he would generally go around the temple and look in every room to see that everything was being kept clean. And if it wasn't clean, he would really complain and he would tell the leaders, you have to take care. Cleanliness is next to godliness. So it's, it's a very important quality. Some people, they oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. Very important. Internal cleanliness and external cleanliness. 
both. So internal means everyone has to chant, everyone has to go to temple program. They're not going to keep clean unless they do these things. Then 25, freedom from envy. We shouldn't have bitter feelings of others. Oh, somebody's got this. Oh, why he got that position? I should have got that position. Oh, he got the maha. I didn't get the maha. Oh, yeah, like that. We, <laughs> we can get envious of people for things. We should be careful not to have this envy. I, ultimately, we're all envious of Krishna. The one we all envy is Krishna. That's why we're all here in the material world. Ichadvaisha samutena danva mohina bharata. All living entities are born in this world, overcome by desire and envy. Desire to be God and envious of God. We're envious of Krishna because Krishna has more than us. Krishna is more attractive, he's more wealthier, he's stronger, he's more famous. He's more renounced. Everything is better. So we are envious of Krishna. And we are envious, we're envious of many other people also. So we have to be careful, try to get rid of that envious nature. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, because you are not envious of me, therefore I am speaking this Bhagavad Gita to you. And, and Srimad Bhagavatam is, those, is for those who have given up envy. So, it's a very important quality. Then the final quality, freedom from the passion for honour. And this is for all, especially sudras. <laughs> sudras should not want to get honour. They should want to res respect others. Yeah, the working class. They shouldn't have a passion for honour. They should just, they're simply workers. So they, they don't, they should not want that kind of position. They, the rather their duty is to respect others. Alright, so these are the 26 qualities. Now, suppose I was to ask you, you know, you want to cultivate a quality. One of these qualities, one quality, you know, which quality do you think you would like to cultivate most? We will ask Shopa Mataji, Shopa Sham Mataji, which of these 26 qualities would you like to cultivate? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, um, I think freedom from the passion for honour. Oh, freedom from the passion for honour. Okay, how will you do it then? It's difficult because I think I'm always looking for, for honor. So I, I maybe think because I'm because you're not you're not sudra. You see, that's the thing. You're allowed honor because you're you have a, you're you're in the Vaishya category, right? You're not sudra. <laughs> you're business class. So the sudras, the workers, they're not allowed this passion for honor. But Vaishyas, it's all right. We have a lot of Vaishyas, they get a lot of honour. You know, Bill Gates and people like that, you know. <laughs> big big Vaishyas. Uh, then I would like to uh, cultivate aversion to fault-finding. Okay, aversion to fault-finding. How can we do this? How would you go about doing this? Um, I, I think that each time when I see a fault, then that fault is in me, right? If I'm seeing somebody, uh, for example, being so proud, I think, oh, that person is so proud. So then that probably that quality is in me. So then trying to see that how I should reduce that, that quality in me. Okay. Can we, we'll ask the other devotees. How, would you, how do you think we could avoid this fault finding? Anybody else has got some suggestions? Yes, by appreciating others. Oh, sorry. All right, that's a good idea. 
to glorify, to praise other people. Instead of criticizing them, to praise them and, and to see the good they're doing, talk about their good qualities rather than criticize them. Very good, yes? Yes? Okay, you can go. Before seeing fault in others, first we should look inside ourselves. So if there is any fault, that is why we are seeing fault in others. Well, Shilpa Maharaji said this. This is just what she said also. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, I did an activity for this. I chose some uh, people in the temple who were like I was feeling they were doing some offenses. And I write their names on paper. And uh, then I what I did, I uh, gave much time and sat down and st start writing the qualities of those people. Uh, of those devotees. Like uh, I wrote uh, of each devotee, I decided that, how, that I wrote about 10 to 20, 20 qualities, good qualities in them. Then I all forget all that uh, faults that I was seeing. Then uh, I just forget all that. Oh, okay. So, so I find it a very good activity. Like so, activity. so that's just like what the other Maharaji said. She said, you know, praise them rather than criticize them. If we praise them, if we see the good in them, it will be much better. Right. So you did that, you sat down and you wrote yes, out? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, very good. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, can I say something? All right. Uh, uh, Maharaj, many a times uh, our fault finding is because of uh, our lack of understanding or there is a lack of communication. Uh, many a times we see that uh, with whomever we find fault, they, we are, they are actually victims of victims. There is a reason why they are the way they are and when we understand them, then our propensity to find fault also finishes. So out of uh, uh, out of care and out of uh, love, if we uh, try and understand why uh, they did what they did, it helps us to understand them better and also, uh, you know, uh, help ourselves and themselves. And the other thing, even then, if we don't, we are not able to overcome, then it, the best thing is to pray to the Lord to relieve us from that and also to help the other person. Pray for the other person. All right, very nice. Yes, we can pray to the Lord to help us to overcome this tendency. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, what about if we wanted to cultivate the quality of freedom from anger? How are you going to do this? Freedom from anger. Hare Krishna, Nanda Pranam Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Nanda Pranam Maharaj. Hare Krishna, I, in my opinion, that to free ourselves from anger, first we start from our food, our prasadam, which is not too spicy, not too seasoned. First is from uh, food and also not taking prasad from outside, non prasadam. And next is we wake up early in the morning, do our sadhana nicely, and chant our round nicely. And the third is that we always see ourselves. What is our qualification? Always realize that we are so much not so more qualified from them, from others. Well, somebody may say, look, if I wake up early in the morning, it makes me irritable and I get angry with everybody. <laughs> so I, uh, it does me better not to get up in the morning. If I have a good rest and a good sleep, I sleep a lot, then I, I'm, I'm more calm and I don't get so angry. But when I have to get up early in the morning for the morning program and there I get, I'm easily irritated. What do you say? Yeah, it is because we are so tired, maybe. Yes. We 
got so much really easily irritated. And uh, that's also because we are not following the rules and regulations nicely or we do not regulate ourselves. So that's why it happens. But if we try to follow and regulate our life, we may become more calm. Well, I'm saying when try to follow, it makes me more tired, more, more and I get angry easy. Okay. Yes. Good. Good answer. It's going to take time. Good. It's going to take time. I th I appreciate that. Thank you. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I just say something? Yes, please. Uh, about uh, about the anger, like uh, it is usually because of lack of acceptance of whatever is happening. And in our case, if we accept whatever is happening as the mercy of the Lord or coming from the Lord, then it becomes a little easy to accept and hence curb our anger to some extent. Well, that's transcendental vision. <laughs> you have to be quite advanced to think like that, to see it all coming from the Lord. But we, that, that's also, you know, that's uh, like an excuse. Oh, the, the anger is not really me, it's coming from Krishna. <laughs> it's not my anger, it's, all, it's Krishna. Krishna made me angry. Hmm? situation that has incited the person, that situation I'm talking about, acceptance of the situation. I'm talking about acceptance of the situation. Okay, accept the situation. Hmm. Yeah, we, we just have to be careful about, you know, the, the how we try to accept it and how we try to avoid it. Yes, please. Maharaj, we should always, uh, like, uh, especially read Bhagavad Gita chapter 3rd, last part, because about there it's said that anger is our enemy. If we regularly uh, um, contemplate on these things and listen uh, to uh, read all these scriptures, then our anger will automatically draw down, because we will know it's our enemy, lust and anger. Yes. You're right. We should read that section from the Bhagavad Gita. Anger, the younger brother of lust, right? And lust, the all devouring sinful enemy. We have to read that section again and again. And we should know it. And we can read also about the, in the in the 16th chapter, Three Gates to Hell. One of them is also anger. So anger is very degrading. All right. So the twenty-six qualities we understand they're for according to people's different ashrams. Not necessarily that we have to cultivate all of these. Yes. Can Can I say something for the anger? All right. That uh, we have to pray to Guru that. To Nityananda Prabhu also because Nityananda Prabhu is the uh, what uh, Akroda Paramananda like that uh, he is never angry with anyone so we we pray to Guru to Nityananda Prabhu I think the anger can be reduced from our heart yes if if one is able to pray to Lord Nityananda if you're able to pray to Nityananda then your anger is not too bad. Sometimes people, when they get angry though, they're just not able to pray. They're not able to think of any anything like that. 
because they're so angry, their mind's so disturbed, they're so disturbed, they're just not able to pray. That's the nature of anger, that it's so degrading, it makes it very difficult to think of the Lord. It's a nice thought, but it's just not so easy to do. <laughs> Maharaj, can I say something? All right. Uh, Maharaj, for anger, if like uh, I have seen like practically, we can try varieties at that time. Like we can choose something if we, it's not working, like read Shastra, it's not working. Then uh, listen to some Kirtan and Prabhupada Kirtan especially. Some, uh, there is so much variety in Krishna consciousness, some will definitely work and we can control our anger very easily and quickly. Well, you say like that, I know it's not so easy. When people get angry, it's not easy for them to come in the kirtan. You'll see them say, no, I'm not going to come in the kirtan. You know, <laughs> they get really, you know, they get angry, they get emotional. And they're just not able to come into the kirtan. It's not we such a... We can do it home also, Maharaj. Like, we can do, like, immediately if we are in angry mood, then we can, like, do some activities different, different. No, what they should do, they should go out, take the japa bag and go out and go out for a walk and calm down. Can I ask something? Yes. What? All right. So we'll go ahead. We can share with you. All right. So after the divine qualities, then Lord Krishna explains the demoniac qualities. Is everyone able to hear me? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Guru. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, verse number four: pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those of demoniac nature, O son of Prita. Right? So we, we can see anger is there, arrogance, pride, harshness, ignorance, not good things, you know, things we really don't want to be near. We want to keep away from them, keep a distance from them. So these are the demoniac qualities and Lord Krishna is going to explain more about the, the nature of these demoniac qualities. Lust, anger and greed also coming up, 21st verse, so also demoniac qualities. First of all, uh, Abhijatashya, in speaking the 26 qualities, was described about abhijatashya, the meaning to be born with these qualities. Right, I'll just read from the purport. The word abhijatashya, in reference to one born of transcendental qualities, of godly tendencies, is very significant. To beget a child in a godly atmosphere is known in the Vedic scriptures as Garbhadana Samskara. If the parents want a child in the godly qualities, they should follow the ten principles recommended for the social life of the human being. So we see some people are, you know, they're born with, they have very good qualities, they have divine qualities. And some people, they're very demoniac, just from the birth. They have these bad qualities. Now, of course, you'll say, well, we're a mixture. We've got some good qualities and some bad qualities. That's because the devotee and the demon are in the same body. When Jagai and Madhai had attacked Lord Nijananda, Lord Chaitanya was coming to kill them because they had, they had injured Lord Nityananda. And Lord Nityananda is very dear to Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya came, was in an angry mood. He was calling for the Surasan Chakra. 
And Jagai and Madhai were terrified. They understood Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was ready to kill them. But Lord Nityananda reminded Lord Chaitanya, he said, My Lord, in this age you must be merciful. Because Lord Nityananda understood how in previous yugas Lord Krishna would kill the demons. But in the Kali Yuga he doesn't kill any demon because the demon and the devotee are in the same body. However, some people are more demoniac and others are more divine or more godly. And it is all connected to the time of conception. In the Vedic culture, this Garbhadan Samskar is very important to produce good quality children. Right? We want good children with good qualities. Everyone wants to have a good child. How to get good qualities? You do this Garbhadan Samskar, then you attract a good soul and you can have nice a nice child who will be a good devotee. And it really works. It really works. You get very nice children if you do the Garbhadan Samskar. It's a science. It's a science to produce good children. But we need good children for the future of our Krishna consciousness movement. Very important for our movement. Mentioned in the previous These are the different samskars which are there, just like, you know, Garbhadan samskar, and then there's another one before birth, and then there's Anaprasna, and then there's another samskar when he gets education, begins education, and there's another samskar at marriage, and like that, and there's another samskar at the end of life, these, these things. So these demoniac qualities are taken on by them from the beginning of their bodies in the wombs of their mothers. And as they grow, they manifest all these inauspicious qualities. You know, some like children born uh, out of marriage, the woman is not married but she's conceived a child in the womb and maybe they were intoxicated even at the time. So, you, they don't attract auspicious souls into the womb. They attract souls who carry a lot of karma into the womb. And they're born into these kind of situations. They're born into a, a home. The mother has, you know, there's no father, unmarried mother. Maybe the mother's a drug addict or something, or an alcoholic, whatever. And so, the children being brought up in, the, in that kind of environment, these souls who come into the womb of these ladies, they bring with them the inauspicious qualities. You're not going, it's not just by chance, it's a science. Everything, there's reasons for everything. So these demoniac qualities are there from the womb. And when they, they're born, then they manifest them. So Arjuna was hearing about the demoniac qualities and he was worried that maybe he was a demon. He was thinking, maybe I'm a demon. Oh no, you, because he's going to fight. He's going to have to do this. And he thought, I'm a demon. But Krishna says, no, he said, do not worry, O son of Pandu. You are born with the divine qualities. So, so Arjuna, Arjuna, he's... Uh, they're not the son of Indra, he's, the son, he's born from the semen of Indra in the womb of Kunti. So he's born with very good qualities. Prabhupada explains, his involvement in the fight was not demoniac because he was considering the pros and cons not acting under the influence of anger, false prestige, or harshness. So Arjuna, he, he has these good qualities. He's fighting, he's going to, he, and we see also the, his hesitancy 
to fight. He was hesita hesitating because he's a devotee, because he has these good qualities. Somebody is in, in the mode of passion or ignorance, you know, they just they decide to, they're, okay, I'm going to fight, and they go out there, oh, I'm not going to fight, and they just run away. But Arjuna is very careful, he's considering, and he's asked Krishna for guidance. He asked Krishna, you know, I'm your disciple, tell me what to do. He's very thoughtful about everything. That's the nature of the devotee, not to make rash decisions. Okay? Prabhupada's comment here. Text number six. In this world, there are two kinds of created beings. One is called divine and the other demoniac. <laughs> in, in, the, in the Satya Yuga, there were very few demons, practically everyone was a devotee, and they were all very saintly. But then the, the next Yuga, the Treta Yuga, there were demons, but the demons were in the forest. You know, Lord Rama had to go into, into the forest and Jarakanda to kill the different Rakshasas and the demons who were residing there in the forest. And then in the Treta Yuga, the demons, they, they came also into the towns and into the cities. And you see Lord Krishna killing the different kings, the different demon kings, Kamsa and so on. But in the Kali Yuga, the demon and the devotee are in the same body. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this so this, this nature, this tendency is there. Sometimes we're very devoted, very divine, godly, and other times we can be quite demoniac. So how can we keep ourselves steady? How can we cultivate this divine quality, the divine nature? What's the solution? Everywhere there's so much influence of the age of Kali, the modes of nature is so strong, how can we protect ourselves? How can we keep our position under the divine nature? Anyone would like to say? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. Can I? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Amarat, I think uh, by being closer to Krishna, uh, one can uh, one can be closer to uh, by being closer to Krishna. I, I, in my opinion, Maharaj. So how can we be close to Krishna? Uh, by chanting regularly, uh, following the regulative principles, uh, and following the sadhana properly. Right. Yes, we have to we have to wake up early, we have to go to Mongol RT, we have to chant, we have to take part in the morning program. If we do these things, this will help us greatly to, to cultivate the good qualities, the divine qualities, simply by taking part in all the devotional activities. Because everything in the morning program, everything in the temple activities is there to help us cultivate the good qualities to develop the good qualities. Srila Prabhupada explains, so they do not like people in divine nature. They will tolerate all kinds of noise, barking of the dogs, the motor car passing, the aeroplane on overhead. But as soon as there is kirtan, they're disturbed. They'll tolerate so many different types of noise, but they'll not tolerate kirtan. Prabhupada continues, In the morning, at seven o'clock, we used to hold our class, and there was little sound. A little sound, meaning Prabhupada would play the kartal, small kartal, do, do, ding, 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 ding. Immediately, the tenants from upwards, they'll come down and complain. 
Sometimes they will call for police. And on the street, 2nd Avenue in New York City, there's always big, big trucks and motor cars going on. Heavy sound. Then, in your country, the garbage carrier sound. The digging sound. So many sounds they'll tolerate. And as soon as Hare Krishna, oh, it is intolerable. This is demonic. This is Prabhupada's lecture from the 16th chapter, verse 7, in Hawaii. And so Prabhupada saw the nature, these people. Prabhupada was living in, a, in an apartment building. So there were people upstairs, and I think he was on the second or third floor, and there were people upstairs. And so some young devotees were coming to him, and Prabhupada would have a little program, a little kirtan, but so easily they would get upset. So Prabhupada knew the difficulties, that these tendencies are there. Demoniac people, they don't like. Hare Krishna. They don't like to hear the chanting. So much noise everywhere. Big garbage trucks coming, making so much noise, and traffic on the roads. But Hare Krishna devotees, no, this is wrong. We have to stop these people, get rid of the... So this is the demon. So that nature is there. Uh, so, the, the, the first section, transcendental and demoniac qualities, covered in the first sixth verse, and then text 7 to 18, Lord Krishna is describing the demoniac nature. Uh, we can go through that, it's very interesting, there's some very nice verses there. Uh, we'll go through it in a minute, I'll just run through the overview with you. The, then, after describing the demoniac nature, then we hear the, the results of demoniac activities. What happens? People who have this demoniac nature, where, where do they go? What's the result? Well, we, we're not going to have the group exercise because in the past we used to do this. We used to give out newspapers and so on, but it's not... I don't have any newspapers now, but what we'll do, we'll go through the purports. Uh, let me, let me, oh, that's going on to the next, we'll, we'll close this just now, and we'll, we'll go into the text. Let's, if we get the Bhagavad Gita, we'll go through some of these demoniac qualities. Wait, I'll just share the screen again. Mm. Are you able to see the Bhagavad Gita? Oh, that's not Bhagavad Gita. Wait, here. Are you able to see Bhagavad Gita? Yes. Yeah. Everyone? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, you've got it, huh? Okay. All right, so text number seven, very important verse, a nice verse for describing the demonic nature. Pavritim cha nevritim cha. Janana vidura suraha. Right? Pavriti and nevriti. Pavriti meaning the things which we, we, we should do and the navriti, the things we shouldn't do. Pavriti, what should be accepted, navriti, what should be given up, what we shouldn't do. So, demonic people, Lord Krishna describes here, the demons, they don't know what is to be done and what is not to be done. So Prabhupada explained in a very nice lecture, he said, we are changing the quality of the pavriti and the nivriti. He said, before coming to Krishna consciousness, 
these young people, they had all different qualities. They were accustomed to eat everything and they were smoking and drinking and many bad habits. But he said, now they're devotees, now they don't even take tea or coffee. And now they don't eat meat, fish or eggs and they're very, very, very strict in their habits. So Prabhupada said, this way we are changing the pavriti and the nivriti. When people become a devotee, their habits change. Prabhupada would sometimes say, it's just like when people get married. Before, when they're single, they have friends. But after marriage, then they have different friends. So like that, becoming a devotee, we, have, we give up the, the bad habits. The, those people who are still smoking and drinking and have all the bad habits, we don't associate with them anymore because we've stopped that. We're not taking even tea or coffee. We're not taking cigarettes. We're not doing it. So, so many nonsense things we've avoided. No Coca-Cola, right? None of these things. We just take Krishna Prasada. And then also cleanliness, nor proper behavior, nor truth is found in them. So cleanliness. Devotees take bath every day. That surprises people. You know, especially if you come from a country like Russia, it's very cold. <laughs> uh, northern part, the northern regions of the world, very, very cold. People don't bathe regularly. It's so cold, minus 30 degrees. And sometimes the people, they don't even have water. They don't, they don't have water in their home. So they, they don't have bath regularly. But devotees, they like to bathe. They like to bathe every day. And of course it's common in India, everyone bathes every day. Generally, they like to anyway, wash the cloth every day. So this kind of cleanliness, not only externally but internally also. Clean the heart by chanting the holy names of the Lord. But the demons, they won't do these things, right? Prabhupada said, you know, as soon as they play the cartels a little bit, they call the police, get the police. They're demons, they don't like. So the demons are not clean. And then behavior, what is the proper behavior? This is described in the purport. Prabhupada talks about women about the position of women, how women should be protected. This is proper behavior. Gen sometimes we see Kali Yuga, women are exploited. They're not given proper respect or proper protection. Women should be protected, they should be taken care of. Prabhupada explains that every stage of her life, women should be protected. When she's young, she's with her father. When she's grown up, she's with her husband. And in old age, she's with her son. So women are always, should always be protected. But the, today, modern society, we see women have a different life. They're all in business and, you know, the, <laughs> the, the social condition is just so different. And the women are taken advantage of. They, they say men and women are equal. And the idea is the woman should go out to work. But it's the woman who gives birth. The man never gives birth. Women give birth. But the, the, if the woman is also working, and she's also going out to, to work, then it's not fair. So women are taken advantage of in these different ways. So we want to protect women. And then, what else was the other one? Behavior and truth. Truth is, yeah. <laughs> how, how often do you find people to be truthful? Even the leaders of the country, the politicians, they tell so many lies, they cheat. There's so much corruption everywhere. So this is Kali Yuga. But devotees, we speak the truth. 
We follow the the, the Shastras. All right, that's text number seven. And text number eight, also another very powerful ex de uh, description of the demoniac nature. Asajama pratishtamte jagadadhur anaishwaraha. Anaishwaram. They say there's no God. They say this world is unreal, that it has no foundation, no God in control. And they say it's produced of se sex desire, no other cause than lust. So this is a demonic nature. They think the world is just meant for having sex, satisfy the senses. And, and then they say the world, this world is not real, so it doesn't matter what you do, you can do whatever you like. There's no God in control, nobody's going to punish you. You don't have to worry, at time of death, everything is finished, right? This is the demonic nature. They talk like that, the demons. Text number nine, Krishna introduces the term Ugra Karmana. Ugra Karmana means engaged in painful activities. Can you think of some activities which are like that, which are ugra karma, like horrible work meant to destroy the world. Prabhupada gives some examples of ugra karma. He talks about the animal slaughter, the slaughterhouses and atom bombs, which the, the different nations are building atom bombs that they can destroy each other. Can you think of some ex examples of ugra karma? War. Yeah, well, I mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, even uh, illicit sex and uh, drinking, smoking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> viruses. Making viruses. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Guru Maharaj, but what about the industries, the factories? Yes, well. They're generally also producing so many things for sense gratification. So Prabhupada does talk about those things that, you know, so much of the land is used for big factories and people, unfortunate workers, they have to work in these unhealthy conditions. It's all, that is, this is also Ugra Karma, yeah, big factories with many people all working in there, just producing objects for the sense gratification of a few people. Ugra karma, doing things, like they will, they will, they'll go to great endeavors to do things, like they build tunnels under the ocean. They have a tunnel, they have a, a tunnel now between England and France, right? You can go in the tunnel, you can drive or go on the train through the tunnel between England and France. But to build that tunnel, you know, they labored so much, people died building it, putting this tunnel through the bottom of the ocean. Why? Just so people could, you know, go, <laughs> travel one country to another, for their sense gratification, for their eating and sleeping, and their mating and defending. No, for, not for any real good, useful purpose. So this is all Ugra Karma, horrible, nasty works, which you know, meant to just destroy the world. The, how they build these big, big cities and they want more and more people to live underground. There's already so many people living above the ground. So, okay, we'll live under, under the ground. Let more and more people live underground. There's, so they start building it people, and people go and live underground. Underground 
four, five floors, six floors under the ground. I was in, I was in Taiwan when I was studying some Chinese classes in Taiwan. I was going to a college and we were in the, the fourth floor under the ground. <laughs> it wasn't very nice being under the ground, four floors. But these things are there. They, they feel safer, build it under the ground, go in the ground, everybody underground. Hellish. No fresh air, no natural light, nothing. So this is all Ugra karma. They will go to great endeavors for all these things. Alright, then text number 10 describes taking shelter of insatiable lust, absorbed in the conceit of pride and false prestige, the demoniac, thus illusioned, are always sworn to unclean work, attracted by the impermanent. Attracted by the impermanent. People like <laughs> the impermanent. They don't realize the temporary nature of these things. They think they can enjoy it. So this is the nature of lust. So material life is in, like that. The demons, they want to enjoy these temporary pleasures of the senses. And then Krishna, Lord Krishna describes in the next verse, they believe that to gratify the senses is the prime necessity of human civilization. Thus, until the end of life, their anxiety is immeasurable, bound by a network of hundreds and thousands of desires, absorbed in lust and anger, they secure money by illegal means for sense gratification. Prabhupada's purport says, the demoniac accept that the enjoyment of the senses is the ultimate goal of life, and this concept they maintain until death. They do not believe in life after death, and they do not believe that one takes on different types of bodies according to one's karma or activities in this world. So they think they can do whatever they want. In the time of death, everything is finished. So like this, the, the demons, they have, they have no religion, they have no faith in God, they don't believe in anything. They just only think sense gratification, we're happy. So uh, Krishna goes on to describe the demonic nature. I draw your attention, verse number 14. The second half of the verse, it describes there the demonic nature. Ishwaroham aham bhogi, siddhoham balavam sukhi. Often quoted, Ishwaraham, I am the Lord, I am the Ishwara. Aham bhogi, I am the enjoyer. Siddhoham, I am perfect. Balavam, I am strong. And Suki, I am happy. <laughs> right? This is the mood of the materialist, the demon. He's thinking like that. I am the controller. I am I am strong. I am happy. Like this. And and then he, he also if I, if I, if he has an enemy, my enemy, I'll have him killed. My other enemies will also be killed. Why? Because I am the Lord. I am the enjoyer. I am perfect, powerful, happy. I am the richest man, surrounded by aristocratic relatives. There is none so powerful and happy as I am. I shall perform sacrifices. I shall give some charity. Thus I shall rejoice. In this way, such persons are deluded by ignorance. Hmm? 
So, because they're so attached to a sense enjoyment, of course, they have to go down to hell. They're not going to get a very good destination. They don't hesitate to do anything sinful for their sense gratification. Yes? Oh, oh, really? Oh, thank you, Prabhu. Then I'll, okay, I'll, I'll charge up. Yeah. Thank you. So you can see the demoniac nature is very powerfully described here in this chapter. And Lord Krishna is really making it clear to all of us what we have to be aware of, how we have to try to avoid these tendencies. But of course, it's very, very difficult. Just to read a little bit from the purport there at the end of the purport of verse number 16. Prabhupada writes, similarly, in the present age, such demoniac men are striving to reach the higher planetary systems by mechanical arrangements. These are examples of bewilderment. The result is that without their knowledge, they are gliding toward hell. Here the Sanskrit word moha jala is very significant. Jala means net, like fish caught in a net. They have no way to come out. So, very difficult situation. You get cut, stuck in this position. Very difficult to get out. You need mercy. The mercy of the holy name. The mercy of the devotees. Text 17 goes on. Self-complacent, always impudent, impudent de deluded by wealth and false prestige. They sometimes proudly perform sacrifices in name only, without following any rules or regulations. Text 18. Bewildered by false ego, strength, pride, lust and anger, the demons become envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is situated in their own bodies and in the bodies of others, and blaspheme against the real religion. Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life. So now Krishna is describing the destination of these demons. Right? What is their destination? The demoniac species of life. Text 20 further describes attaining repeated birth among the species of demon, such persons can never approach me. Gradually they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, he said, it is known that God is all merciful, but here we find that God is never merciful to the demoniac. He's never merciful to them. And at the end, he said, the placing of the demons in the lowest status of life is simply another feature of his mercy. <laughs> so two ways. He said he's never merciful. And then he said he's, when he puts them in the lower species, that is his mercy. And so <laughs> it's a bit like the Christian idea that you get put into hell and damnation eternally. So these demons also, they're put into hell and damnation eternally. They sink down to the lowest species of life and they take birth, they take birth in such species like Prabhupada mentions, dogs and hogs. Gradually sink down to become dogs and hogs, maybe jackals, these kind of creatures, snakes. So, very low birth, not very pleasant. 
Then text 21 brings up three gates leading to hell. Lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up, for they lead to the degradation of the soul. The, the key, the, the most important quality to beware of is lust, because anger and greed are coming from lust. When our lust is satisfied, then we want more. We become greedy for more. And when our lust is not satisfied, then we become angry in our frustration. So the anger and the greed, they come from the lust. The lust is like the older brother, and the anger and the greed, they're the younger brothers. They come after the lust. So we have to really watch out for this enemy, lust. As we heard, it's described in the third chapter. You've already studied that section, the nature of lust, how it burns like fire, never satisfied. And the way to conquer over it, by regulating the senses and by cultivating proper knowledge, then we can overcome this tendency. But we have to be very conscious and very aware and guard against it, because we don't want to fall into degradation. And that lust can carry us down, right down. So then text 22 describes, the man who has escaped these three gates to hell he performs acts conducive to self-realization and thus gradually attains his supreme destination. Prabhupada says in the purport, the more a person is free from lust, anger and greed, the more his existence becomes pure. We have to purify our existence and so how to, of course, just, as I said, simply by practicing Krishna consciousness, following regulative principles, we will naturally purify our existence. You do the chanting, we read the books, read the Bhagavad Gita, we take part in the activities of devotion, we get purification. Not everybody wants that purification. We had one devotee lady, she took prasadam home to her husband and she offered her husband prasadam. He said to her, I don't want to get purified. <laughs> so some unfortunate people are like that. They don't want purification. So text 23, very important verse also. You should, you should, I think maybe you have to memorize this one, text 23. And it's about the scriptures, about Shastra Vidim, the regulation of the scripture. Hmm. That, Ya Shastra Vidim Mutsrijya Varta Te Kama Karata Nasasidim Avapnoti Nasukam Na Param Gatim. Right? Nasasidim. Perfection, you won't get perfection, uh, you won't get this uh, su sukham, happiness, and you won't get the supreme destination. So, he achieves neither perfection, neither happiness, nor the supreme destination, because he disregards the scriptural injunctions and acts according to his own whims. So very important to be guided by Shastra. That's why we're distributing so many books. We want everyone to know, because some people simply say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know. So we give them the book, here, take the book, read the Bhagavad Gita. Now you have no excuse, it's all there. So somebody disregards the scriptures, they can never get 
perfection or happiness or the supreme destination. In the purport, Srila Prabhupada writes, But even if he follows the rules and regulations and moral principles and ultimately does not come to the stage of understanding the Supreme Lord, then all of his knowledge becomes spoiled. And even if he accepts the existence of God, if he does not engage himself in the service of the Lord, his attempts are spoiled. Therefore, one should gradually raise himself to the platform of Krishna consciousness and devotional service. It is then and there that he can attain the highest perfectional stage, not otherwise. So Prabhupada is making the point that it's not enough just to be moral and just to follow the rules and regulations. We have to also understand Krishna. We have to understand what, what he's teaching and who he is, his identity. And then even then it's not enough. You have to, you have to engage in service. We want to know what service are you doing? We want to do service, that's very important, to be engaged in some service for the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Just like we distribute books, we give out books, we distribute prasadam, we give the holy name. That's all very valuable service for Krishna. Serving the Krishna Consciousness Movement means service to Krishna. So everyone's encouraged like that. You do service. Text 24. One should therefore understand what is duty and what is not duty by the regulations of the scripture. Knowing such rules and regulations, one should act so he may gradually be elevated. So, uh, Prabhupada explains that both the impersonalists and the personalists they both ex accept scriptures. They both accept the scriptures. They both accept the Vedas. Of course, some, some people, they don't accept Bhagavad Gita. They, they just follow the Vedas, the Shruti. They don't follow the Smriti. But they have scriptures. Everybody has some, some kind of scriptures. It's important. We have to follow. So one has to raise himself to the mode of goodness before the path of understanding the Supreme Lord can be opened. And to come to the mode of goodness, we have to cultivate the, the good qualities. If we're coming, if we're really coming to the mode of goodness, then these good qualities should be manifesting gradually in us, simply by engaging in devotional service. We just simply have to engage in devotional service and all of these good qualities will develop. The good qualities come naturally by devotional service. We just have to engage in chanting and hearing, do sadhana bhakti and naturally all of these good qualities will come about. You don't have to cultivate them individually. Oh, I have to become more forgiving, or I have to become more humble, or I have to become more nonviolent. No, you just simply have to be a devotee. And by being a devotee, gradually, naturally, all these qualities will develop. Okay, are there any questions? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, what is the difference between cultivation of knowledge and Vedic study? And uh, the cultivation of uh, knowledge is for sannyasis and Vedic study is for brahmacharis. Like why it's specifically mentioned for them only? Why not for others? It's not, I can't understand why it's mentioned for them only. It's mentioned for them and the difference between both. 
Well, it's not mentioned for them only, but it, especially it's meant, meant for them. Particularly it's meant for them. Brahmachari life, it's a time, you know, when they're brahmachari, there's, it's like a student life, right? Student. So student life is meant for study. Once they, you know, once they get a little older, then usually they move into the Grihastha ashram, they have a family, they don't get so much opportunity to study. So it's important that while they're young, they study and they get the good education that can give them the strength to keep them in Krishna consciousness throughout their life. Prahlad Maharaj said, Komara Charet Pragno Dharmam Bhagavatamiha. From the age of five, they should begin their study. But everybody has to read the books. You know, we don't say only Brahmacharis are supposed to read the books. Everyone should read the books. Everyone can learn the philosophy. But especially the, when people are young, it, it's a very good time. Somebody, uh, the, some one time reporters were asking Prabhupada that all of your followers, they all seem so young. You know, when Prabhupada was there in the, in the 70s especially, you can see that maybe if you watch the movie, the Hare Krishna people or the world of Hare Krishna, and you see the devotees and they're all so young, so many young people, hardly you can see one old person. They're all, they were all so young. And so they asked Prabhupada, you have so many young people. Even that, I was hearing, uh, Prabhupada went to Geneva in Switzerland and the governor of Geneva was worried and he, he met Prabhupada and he said he was worried about the young people all joining the Hare Krishna movement, that there would be no young people to uh, keep the economy going in Geneva because everybody is going to join the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> so uh, Prabhupada explained to him about Varnashram that it's not that everybody would just be a, you know, a full-time missionary worker, but there would be Vaishyas, there would be Brahmanas, there would be Kshatriyas and workers. Everyone would have some occupational duty. So Brahmacharis, you know, it's a good time to study. And Prabhupada said, yeah, we have young people because that's the time for education. You go to the colleges, you go to the unis and like that, you will see young people, mostly all young people, they're there studying. That's the time for education. So brahmacharis, that's the time for education. Are you envious of the brahmacharis? <laughs> uh, next we have Ganga Prasad Prabhu, my right? Yes. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Ganga Prasad Prabhu. Vibhava uh, Ganga Prasad Prabhu. Are you there, Prabhu? Not there. Put his hand up. <laughs> Go ahead, Ganga Prasad Prabhu. You, you have unmuted yourself. You may ask the question, Prabhu. Okay, he's not responding. Does anybody else have a question? Can I ask that? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, usually I hold my anger, my, I keep it for myself and not, uh, you know, not exploding it or not uh, showing it or not, yeah, like that. So the psychology or the healthy side says that it is harmful. If you hold your anger 
in a bit of scarf, something like that. So can I continue to do that, Marat, or what should I do? Well, what we should do, we should understand the origin of the anger. You should become philosophical about it and you should analyze the, why are you becoming angry, where is your anger coming from, what is it based on. And in this way we should root out the cause of the anger. We have to... I was speaking, but it's like I, wa I was not audible. Okay, you have to my wait. You have to wait is, now. My question is. No, you have to wait. We're on an we're on another question now. You have to wait. We'll come back to you. We're talking about anger, and you. Know, they're saying that, oh, you, sh you should release the anger, you shouldn't keep it within you. Well, of course, that is, what you can do is transform the anger. Transform the anger into some Krishna conscious activity. That you take, instead of becoming, instead of uh, using the anger to hurl abuse and speak nasty words and be violent and passionate, what you need to do is take up some Krishna conscious activity to transform that anger into devotional service. Instead of wasting the energy in some emotion based on our own sense gratification, we just simply have to engage in some Krishna conscious activity. And maybe it means join a kirtan, go in the kirtan, Maybe it means go out with your bead bag and chant some rounds and walk in the park until you cool down and get rid of the anger. But that's transforming the anger. It's not holding it within you, it's, it's, it's transforming it. The emotion can be transformed and directing it into Krishna conscious activity. So that's not a problem. That's purification. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, sorry for that interruption. Uh, my question is, the 26 divine qualities we read today, they seem to be having some tally with the 20 elements of knowledge, how do we make a reconciliation of both? I don't see any tally with the 20 qualities of knowledge. Yeah, the elements of what? Cleanliness is there, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, all is there in 20 elements. And it's also in these 26 qualities. So I'm saying, how do we tally them? That's what my how do you tally them? What do you mean? How do you count them? Yes, 20 elements of knowledge and the 26 divine qualities. Well, we have to take the way what Krishna has given us. Krishna himself hasn't explained and I, I haven't seen anywhere anyone relating. Although some of the qualities may be common, but still they're used in a different in different context. Yeah, some of the qualities will be there in different ways, different things. Here, in, in this 16th chapter, it's describing the divine nature. And they're mentioning the qualities particularly in relation to different uh, psychophysical activity, according to the ashram or according to the varna. So it's going to vary. For the brahmana, cleanliness is very essential. It's one of the one of the qualities of the brahmana. Right, brahmana should be very clean. We could say everybody should be clean. 
But particularly the brahmana has to be very clean. So we have to be careful how you how you how you relate these points. Some some of the points may be the same, but the circumstance or the use is a little different. Twenty items of knowledge, yeah, items of the that was the process of knowledge, the process of knowledge. So the process of knowledge is also bringing us to the divine nature, bringing us to the mode of goodness, and from the mode of goodness we can transcend. So very, very much related to the divine qualities, right? Yes. Next we have from Dhritatma Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Bhai. You just said uh, regarding to Brahmachari, that Brahmachari is the early stage and the beginning stage to strengthen our Krishna consciousness. But now, the Brahmacharis mostly dealing with material education, especially nowadays. And so what to do about this and so that in this Brahmachari stage, the people can uh, learn more spiritual education, or spiritual knowledge. Well, I don't know what Brahm, what's going on with the Brahmacharis. So he means the common people in the brahmachari age or stage. What, what material, where are they going for material education? Who's giving them material education? The non-devotee, Maharaj, he means the non-devotee. Oh, the non-devotee. Also the, the son, also the, the child of the devotees, they more tend to achieve or pursue their uh, material education. Then they're not brahmacharis. Then they're not brahmacharis. Brahmachari means they live with the guru and they pursue the spiritual education. They're not really brahmacharis. Just because they're not married, just because they're young men, doesn't mean they're brahmacharis. Brahmachari means they live with the guru and they get trained and they live with the sannyasis and they, they travel with the sannyasis. Brahmachari means engaged in spiritual activities on the path of Brahman. They don't go to school, they don't study mundane knowledge. That's not brahmachari. They may be, they may be a bachelor, they may be a student, but they're not brahmacharis unless they live in the ashram and practice spiritual life. Brahmacharis, there's a certain, certain standard behavior for brahmachari, what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to live. Not so easy thing. It's not just because they're single that you're a brahmachari. Yes? Yeah, terima kasih, Guru Muran. Thank you, Master. Next, we have Swarup Krishna Prabhu. Dhanavars Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, when we were um, discussing the austerity point, then you mentioned that retired persons should go to dham and do service. And uh, uh, now, if retired person is unable to go to dham, for whatever reason, maybe they have not developed a certain amount of equipment.
government then uh, what uh, would be your advice number two well they can go to the nearest temple go to find the iskon temple nearby they don't need to go to india they can stay in, the, in their home country nearby maybe iskon temple go there and do service and if they can't do that then they can stay at home and worship the deity have a deity at home and just do a spirit have your own spiritual program at home you don't need to leave the home you can stay with your wife but you have to have you don't you don't go to work you don't have a job your whole day is spent doing spiritual activities worshiping the deity and reading scriptures and chanting the holy name maharaj thanks to this lockdown and covid 19 we are getting these type of courses like bhakti shastri and there will be other courses also which uh, have come which uh, are being delivered online so if one attends these type of courses would you say that would be a right way to uh, uh, spend a retired life well that's part of it that's only a tiny part of it you know The, the Bhakti Shastri course is only two hours a day. It's not taking a lot of time. You're not spending a lot of time, but you have the whole day. So the whole day, you know, you have to be engaged in these different activities. It means chanting, worshiping the deity, studying scriptures. Right. So retired Vana Prastha life. as preparation for the next life so we're preparing ourselves so we spend the, the day engaged in these different activities and part of it you do bhakti shastri okay but bhakti shastri is not going to go on for long but three months or something four months maybe finished then what you going to do vana prastha goes on you know you go on the whole life Right? Maharaj, yeah. Maharaj, see people like us who were engaged in a profession and uh, leading a grihastha life of throughout life and then getting retired. So one did not have time, and obviously we lost time. At this age, one is, uh, I mean, engaging in this these type of services. Don't you think we have we have really lost out? or still there is chance well it's it's up to every individual how they make use of their time it's never too late ajamila at the end of life he became krishna conscious so even at the end of life you know it's never too late if you fully dedicate yourself now to the service of krishna then you can get success you should want to fully absorb yourself in krishna conscious activities it's it's required we want to go back to godhead we have to fully surrender so ajamila did it at the end of life dhritarashtra also left home Dhritarashtra was very attached but by the mercy of Vidura he was able to get some spiritual benefit So you don't want to be like Dhritarashtra sitting at home waiting waiting for death death can come any time we have to be ready we have to be ready it means we have to be krishna conscious we have to be really absorbed in krishna so Pra prabhupada has given us this opportunity we have to take full advantage really dedicate really commit ourselves
to this process. So the older we get, the more closer we come to death. We have to get ready. We have to really be ready to let go of everything and just take shelter, full shelter of Krishna. Right? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Yes, any other questions? So far we don't have any more rays. Praise Him, Maharaj. Okay. So, all right, so then we'll stop here tonight. So we'll meet you again on uh, Monday. Okay. Srila Prabhupada ki. Go back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.